In previous rides, I've talked about how I quit drinking alcohol. I wanted to dedicate one of the rides to this very topic where I talked about why I did it and the benefits and stuff like that. I did an interview with a podcast called How I Quit Alcohol. So sit back, enjoy the podcast, How I Quit Alcohol, my interview. Welcome to another episode of Super Sab 73. Ooh, it's a bit chilly, I might put my gloves on. There we go, gloves are out. In previous rides I've talked about how I quit drinking alcohol. I wanted to dedicate one of the rides to this very topic where I talked about why I did it and the benefits and stuff like that. But I thought I'd make it easy. About a month ago, I did an interview with a podcast called How I Quit Alcohol. And it's run by an Aussie, Aussie pair, Danny and Ash. And they've been going now for a, a bit over a year now, I'd say. Um, and they actually reached out and asked if anyone wanted to be interviewed by them and I thought, yeah, why not? I can give it from a perspective of a sports coach and whatnot. Um, but I've also got the music background too, so I was able to give it from that perspective as well. I think that what I'll, the best thing I'll do, I can do is what I'll do, I'll play that uh, interview I did in its entirety while I ride. Now, big thanks to Danny who gave me permission to use the recording. Um, their podcast is available on all podcast outlets. I listen to it on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. But I'm sure you'd be able to find it in your um, your sort of network of podcast listening devices. But Spotify and Apple Podcasts is the way I go. Um, I'll leave links in the description where you can find it. Uh, their website and also their social media links so if you want more information um, about the podcast you can but it's a it's a podcast that helped me immensely by then I'd already made the decision to stop so it didn't really well I didn't use it as a way to think about stopping I'd already stopped it was a way to kind of um, reinforce why I'd stopped so sit back enjoy the podcast how I quit alcohol my interview this podcast is proudly brought to you by Monday Distillery, who makes sophisticated, elk-free drinks that still have all the taste of a good time. G&T without the tears, whiskey without the wobbles, and other delicious cocktails too. Switching the ritual instead of ditching the ritual is so much easier. Stay in high spirits, keep a clear mind, head to mondaydistillery.com for more. Are you sick of feeling controlled by alcohol? Do you want to drink less? Do you wake up on a Sunday morning feeling really anxious and full of regret? I'm Danny Carr and welcome to my podcast, How I Quit Alcohol. Hi and welcome back to How I Quit Alcohol. Today in the Zoom room, I'm joined by Carl Savamaki, rugby coach and uh, ex-trash bag. <laughs> How are you, Carl? <laughs> oh, good. Thanks, Danny. Thanks for having me on. Thanks so much for reaching out and asking to be on the podcast. I'm stoked. Yeah, so we haven't met. We're just sort of familiarising ourselves with each other um, before I press record. Yeah, I would love to hear your story. Yeah, you're in Sweden? Yep, I'm in Sweden. Um, I've, um, I was previously based in, I was previously based full time in Germany. In between Germany and Sweden, I was going between Chicago and Frankfurt over a two year period before I got my um, coaching role here in Sweden. So I, I left. I left Australia in 2012, just after I got married. I've been married and divorced twice. So awesome. first wife, if I refer to my wives, I'll refer to Aussie wife and German wife or ex, if you will. Um, <laughs> so 
just just shortly after uh, my first marriage to the Aussie wife, uh, moved to the US. I uh, was there for two years, then Germany for five years, Chicago, Gee, now Sweden. You're very continental. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about your journey though with alcohol. Where did that start? Okay. Um, I was a relatively late bloomer when it comes to alcohol. Uh, when I, you know, listening to the podcast, a lot of your guests talk about, you know, some said they started at 11 and 12 years old. And, and generally, I think the common age is sort of around the 13, 14 mark. I didn't actually, the first time I, I had a beer and uh, it was probably I was 16. And I remember the first time I got drunk was at my cousin's wedding was when I was 16. And a lot of my friends and stuff at school you know, in sort of year eight and year nine were the ones that were doing the binge drinking on the weekend, but I didn't start till I was 16. And then um, I went to boarding school. You know, there's not really an opportunity to drink there, um, but my drinking really accelerated when I left school and, you know, I was starting to, you know, play rugby in the local club, uh, but I was also involved in music. I was a, um, a bass player and I was actually a massive Living In fan, but I'll get to that later when ah. I talk about it. <laughs> yeah, um, when I talk about how I found your podcast. But yeah, I, I, the drinking increased heavily when I left school. It was more, I, I didn't drink during the week. It was more a weekend thing. So I was a bit of a weekend warrior. Uh, Friday nights, Saturday nights was, I'd go hard and then be hung over Sunday, then back into work. So that, that kind of carried on for about a year. And then I moved to Perth to go to university. Um, and I lived at a residential college so there was a, a big drinking culture in amongst those sort of environments. That was when it really went into overdrive. You're drinking a lot during the week. You know, you'd have your, your Wednesday um, sessions and then your Thursday sessions and then you'd, you'd be at it again on the weekend. So you're kind of, you're very high functioning when at university. That's, you know, if you're at that time, you don't know what a high function al alcoholic is. You just kind of, you're young, you can, you can handle it. Um, yeah. And the older you get, you can't handle it. Yeah. I was elected the student club president and it was actually that time New Year's Day I woke up with my heart pounding you know I had a big night the night before my heart pounding and I made that decision then to to stop drinking for six months it wasn't a um you know I didn't say to myself oh I'm gonna stop forever it was just six months and I got through my first year as my, you know my last year in uni as a, a student club president I got through a week not drinking I was I was able to in that time I was able to lose a lot of weight so i think i lost about 20 kilos just from not drinking in that six months um i was still playing rugby at the time as well but i was also getting heavily into my um guitar playing because i played guitar as well and i i would practice four to eight hours a day so i was doing a lot of sober gigs out playing at cafes restaurants and i put that down to stopping drinking for six months i felt amazing and then what did i do on my birthday i got drunk to celebrate being sober for six months back on it again then fast forward throughout the years i um i stopped playing guitar and i got into um djing and producing dance music i was releasing music internationally i was i was playing internationally i did a few gigs in europe um and you know that comes with the territory of drinking a lot yeah. you know and this is you know listening to to scotty owens episode um i actually re-listened to it again this morning just so i could get a refresher and and it really resonated with me um you know he's talking about you know, waiting around, there's a lot of waiting, you know, drinking before the show. And when you're waiting, you know, you, you end up drinking a lot. So you, I, I'd often arrive at venues two, three hours before uh, the gig actually started and you'd be hammered when by the time you get on. And then, of course, 6 a.m. comes, you, the, cl the club closes and you, you, you're on it again. Um, so this went on This went on for years and my weight was ballooning, mental, mentally I wasn't healthy. And then... I made the decision, oh, when was, okay, so 2011 rolls around, and that's um, when I was getting married to my Aussie wife. I made the decision then to, to stop before the wedding, and I got, you know, I was pushing sort of 130 kilos at that point, and I thought, right, I want to be fit Gee. for the wedding. I did, um, I did CrossFit for like six months before the wedding, wasn't drinking, um, probably about a week before the wedding. She'd actually gone to the venue a week before, so I was at home, you know, just, you know, tying up loose ends there before I'd, I'd join her for the wedding. And I'd, I'd, I'd covered all triggers when it came to drinking and smoking. Um, you know, I, I was a poker player, so I used to love drinking and smoking when I play poker. I'd, I'd address that. 
when I made music, I used to love to drink. I'd address that. The one thing I didn't address, the one trigger that I didn't address was um, when the, the partner would go away. And <laughs> so the being on your own. Oh, yeah. So the moment she left, it was like a switch went off in my head. I went straight to the bottle. I bought a bottle of vodka, six pack of beer, pack of cigarettes. How long had you been abstaining for? Probably only three or four months. So when you got the bottle of vodka and the packet of cigarettes, was it like you drank the whole bottle of vodka and smoked all the cigarettes? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, well, it's incredible, yeah. isn't it? How you, even after that, that time off, just going straight, it's like bang, it's, it's back in, yeah. all guns blazing. It's like there's yeah. no time off at all. Yeah, exactly. For me, it was all or nothing. You know, I'd, I'd tried many times over the years to stop. Yep. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd be successful for three, four months and then I'd be back on it again. There'd be some trigger that I wouldn't have addressed. So for me, it was, I tried to cut back. I tried to do the whole, oh, I'd only have a couple of beers. No, it didn't work. Um, you know, I'd, I'd have one or two, boom, I'd have more. I, I couldn't have a glass of wine. I'd have to have a bottle or two bottles. So 2012, my Aussie ex gets offered a job in Denver. Um, I got involved in a club there, um, Denver Barbarians. At that time, they were one of the top clubs in the US and they played in the, the top division. We worked hard, but we played hard. So there was a lot of drinking. My Aussie ex and I, we, we'd been drifting apart. We were together 10 years, married for two. Um, we'd been drifting apart. And a lot of our big arguments, the big, big, you know, really screaming arguments were mainly a result of alcohol. The straw that broke the camel's back with us getting divorced involved alcohol she went away for work for a week or two or something so i was at home alone i was drinking my beers and i ran out and she had bought two bottles of wine and her brother had bought a bottle of wine from napa valley these are like three to five hundred dollar bottles of wine now she said to me she showed me these bottles when she got back you know weeks before do not drink these bottles of wine or i'll kill you and then she uh-huh. hid them <laughs> but I, I knew where she put them. So th- this we're pushing like quarter to 12 at night. Now, in the US, as you know, you can buy alcohol at gas stations. You can buy it at um, supermarkets, unlike Australia. So I'm racing to the local 7-Eleven, which is only about 500 metres away. It's, it's 11.58. I get in and the, the clock ticks over to midnight and I'm literally reaching for the fridge to grab another box of Coors Light. And the, the store attendant comes over and locks the door and says, no, no, you can't. I'm not allowed to serve you after midnight. I said, come on, look, it's 11.50. No, it's 12 now. So she couldn't serve it. She couldn't sell me these, this, this box of beer. So I went home. What do you think I did? You opened the wine. Oh, yeah. And in, like, because I was smashed at this point. And I said to myself, right, I'm going to replace this. I'm going to Google it on the internet, try and replace it before she finds out. So <laughs> I can I hide the bottle. I throw it out and... Forget about it. Three months later, I'm with the team um, in Seattle. I get this SMS from from my ex. Long story short, and it was the uh, we need they got the classic. We need to talk when you get back, and it was that moment I knew this. It was over, um, and of course we had the chat and we said right, she keep me out of the bedroom. We sleep in separate beds, and by then it was over, and we 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 separated. So obviously you knew that was special. So it was just you had the can't stops. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, look, um, I was a, I, I, I am a can't, well, I was a can't stop person when it came to drinking. I, I couldn't have one or two over dinner. I'd, I'd have to have a whole bottle or bottle or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I get that because I would get the can't stops as well. Yeah, it's, it's a shitty thing. We've just got divorced and I um, I was still DJing at the time as well. So I, um, over that, that summer, I did a, a tour of Europe and I met a, um, a German lass and uh, decided, you know, I was gonna move to Germany. I hadn't, I hadn't processed the divorce yet, even though it was amicable. It was still the loss of someone I'd been with for 10 years. Um, and, and in some ways, um, you know, when you go through the stages of grief, it's similar to, you know, when someone dies, because it's not only the death of a relationship, it's the death of friendships around that relationship. I hadn't processed it. so. My drinking went to huge levels when I went to Germany. And with my Aussie ex, I was, I was a, a smoker who hid. So I, I, I would sneak a cigarette behind her back. With my German ex, I was a secret drinker. 
So I would drink when she'd go to work and I'd hide the bottles in a bag. And I, again, my, my health and weight went balloon straight back up to 130. I was not in a good state for about three, four years. I needed to stop drinking. Um, and, and something I've learned over the last sort of 12 months of not drinking um, is a lot of the hyper successful people that I've had in my life, you know, the super successful businessmen, entrepreneurs, um, the hugely successful coaches that, that I've got in my sort of network of mentors that I reach out to, the really successful ones, probably 80, 90% of them either don't drink or drink seldomly. I've coached at pretty much all levels. Like I've coached four to six year olds, um, all the way up to elite athletes. Um, but the, the really elite ones that I do know well, they don't drink at all. And that was, you know, that's one of the multitude of reasons why I stopped. When you see people being successful and there's a common denominator as part of it, and I want to be the best rugby coach I can be, you know, mm. it's got to stop. Um, so 2017, I, 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 um, I have a, like a, a short-term gig in, in Chicago. And the culture within this particular team, great bunch of guys, but it was massive drinking culture. And I got to the point there where I was, um, I was drinking during the week, not a lot. Like I wasn't binging during the week. I'd, I'd have like one or two beers every night as a way to wind down boom, to sleep and then binge hard on the weekend. It was then when I started getting the voices in my head and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. When you're really smashed, you're in a voice, you're in a spidey sense and start talking to you. And I started saying to myself, you don't like this. Why are you drunk? You, you're not enjoying this. And that was when the seeds were sown that I should stop. And one particular guy I worked with, I was coaching at a, um, in addition to the club side, I was coaching a um, high school team with a guy called Brendan. And he had been through the ringer of alcoholism um, he got diagnosed with cancer um, throat cancer so he had his you know he had it removed and he's in remission he's fine but he quit drinking and he was just he was a pillar of health so fit and he showed me pictures of when he was um, drinking and he was you know 20 30 kilos heavier but he was just so content with not drinking um, he was happy he was exercising a lot and just a really a positive person to be around so again a little seed of um, you know, little seed was planted in my head. Geez, maybe I should think about this. One other guy in, in, in Chicago that in the actual senior team, an Aussie guy on the back end of his career, uh, he was probably about six years younger than me, back end of his career, and he didn't drink. Aussie, he didn't drink. After the games, we'd go to the pub. Everyone's doing their drinking games, singing songs. He's having his flavoured flavored soda waters, not a care in the world, having fun singing the song as well. So jealous of that. I wanted that. I was like, why do I need to drink after a game all the time? I finish up my role in Chicago and I get offered the job here in Sweden. And when I moved here, I tried to stop. Um, and I stopped successfully for three months. I didn't drink at all when I got here. Um, so I went away on a trip with the under 18s uh, to Poland. Um, and on the second last night, there is a, the Poles, they love their vodka and they love drinking. They had a function on, um, started drinking again i didn't get too smashed because knowing we had a game the next day um for the to round off the tour didn't get drunk drunk too bad i think i maybe had maybe five or six beers and um we went to bed at around 1 1 30 which is not too late in terms of the whole function um and now i was told the bus was leaving at uh 8 30 a.m so i set my alarm for quarter past seven i'd be showered down have breakfast and then on the bus i'm in the shower at 7 30 and I get a knock on the door, Carl, the bus is here. You've got to jump on it. And I'm like, well, I'm in the shower. And they, I said, I'll just get a ride with um, the Polish coaches in the car. And it was all fine. A few months later, I found out that um, some of the players had actually gone back to their clubs and, and someone on the, the big board of the union had heard that I'd missed the bus. And the players had told her that I was drunk, which was completely, completely false. I just missed the bus because they'd moved the time around. That was another reason why I wanted to stop, to stop potential rumours like that getting spread. 
like nothing came of it because I had the, you know, the report got back to this person. You know, he wasn't drunk. Um, but just things like that now don't happen. I don't have those issues anymore of potential rumors being started because I'm not, I'm never drunk. Um, so fast forward, I'm, I'm drinking, I'm binge drinking throughout, you know, I'm not drinking during the week. Uh, after the games with the, uh, with the team, I'm, I'm getting drunk. And then the pandemic hits March. Over that time, I was drinking shitloads for about three months. And I was What's over here in Sweden. They don't have bottle shop. They do have bottle shops. They don't have only one place in every town you can buy alcohol. It's called a system bulletin. And it's only open between during the weekdays. It closes at six o'clock, opens at 10. Weekends, it's only open from 10 till two, four hour window. That's it. That's your t- chance to buy alcohol. So I'd buy this Aussie wine, it's called Chill Out, and it was a cask of wine. So there's four bottles per cask. And on the weekends, I would go through two, maybe three over a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I was going through when I wasn't working because I wasn't doing any on-field coaching. In this period, I was going through maybe six or seven of these, sometimes eight per week. Eight times four is 32 bottles of wine. Nuts. Wow, that's that's some commitment there. Absolute nuts. And... I would that say probably stops, my friend. Oh yeah, and and because I'd go through one, one would go down easily. Then I'd go through a half, and then by then I'd crash out. I'd then start the next half the next morning. Now, I know it, when I was really seeing the Scotty's episode, he was talking about starting drinking. You know, two, three p.m. in the afternoon. I was starting at eleven in the morning. I'd get my work done, then boom, straight into the, the leftover wine from last night and onto another one. I'd say over that three month period, there was maybe five days where I, I didn't drink. And that was when the voices, the little spidey senses in my head were saying to me, you gotta stop. Every time I was smashed, I was saying to myself, you don't like this, why are you doing it? I was I was up to 134 kgs again. I was not happy inside, mentally I was not happy, but it wasn't showing externally. Like I was still getting my work done. My girlfriend did not once say to me, I think you're drinking too much. No one said to me, you know, I did, not one person said to me, you should stop. It all came from within. And it was around midway through June, I listened to Alan Carr's How to Quit Drinking because uh, I'd been successful with the book, with the smoking book 10 years prior. And the big thing I got out of that was getting in touch with your younger self because when you're... When you're a kid and when you're a teenager, remember I said at the start, I didn't start drinking properly till I was 16 to 18. Mm. You can have fun without drinking. You go to a party, you don't need alcohol to drink, uh, to have fun. So a big part of that book was getting in touch with the younger self and deprogramming the brain of every reason you need to drink. So six months go by and I'd, all I did was just stop drinking. I, I was still eating pretty shit. I was eating a lot of hamburgers and stuff, but I still lost like, 10, 12 kilos just from stopping drinking. I'm saving 300 euros a month. I started walking. I mean, I was already walking to work. Um, It's about a 1.7K walk to work. Um, And then during training, I'd walk maybe another three to four K. So I was walking on average six to nine kilometers on a work evening, but I increased that. I would walk, get up in the morning and walk. So I was walking between 17 and 20 kilometers a day. And this, I did this for about four months. And come June, I dropped another, I think it was 12, kilo, 12 kilograms. And I hadn't really cleaned up my diet. I'd just been walking. So then I decided to clean up my diet. Next, uh, Coming up to my one-year anniversary, I dropped another, I think it was another 5 kgs, total 28 kilograms over one year. And I look at the, I look at the day one photo and I look at the one-year photo and I'm like, wow. And... I'm not a big social media person. I don't, I'm pretty reclusive when it comes to social media, but I had to share this um, because I I had a lot of people on my, on my Facebook that had stopped drinking and I wanted them to see how I'd gone. And just the response from that, I I asked people, look, if you, if you need some tips on how to stop, if you're struggling, reach out to me. I'm not trying to show for money here. I can give you some free free resources. I gave them your podcast. I spoke about the book as well. And I had probably had about 15 people reach out to me. And these are people, 
some of them said they read my post and they were in tears um, because they felt exactly the same way. They just couldn't, they couldn't express it. And, and it, it, it tells me there's a lot of people out there that have similar experiences. Like, you know, one of the things that Alan Carr addresses is what is an alcoholic? You know, the, the classic alcoholic that people think is someone who gets drunk every night, has, you know, constantly fights, you know, domestic violence, something like that. that might be an alcoholic. But an alcoholic might be someone who has two beers a day and can't function because of it. You know, there's, there's, and somewhere in between. And I was somewhere in between. Um, you know, I'll be clear, I'd, I'm not one of these um, drinkers that considered, I didn't hit rock bottom. I was close to it, but I didn't hit rock bottom. It didn't affect my work, it didn't affect my relationships too much. Over the years, yeah, okay, I had fights with my, my exes and, you know, you see the odd, odd punch up in, you know, in rugby bars after games and shit like that, which is par for the course. But I didn't, I, you know, I know some people who are real alcoholics that if they stopped, they would die. So I never reached that, mm. that stage. But again, it, it asks the question is what is an alcoholic? So some of these people are probably struggling within. And when they reached out to me, they, you know, it was like, thank you so much. You know, I had all walks of life reach out to me. Some people who I only knew through the music industry that I'd never met, but they saw the progress. And, you know, I, I think you, I mean, you saw the picture as well on, on my Instagram. I looked probably about 50 years old um, in the first two. Mm. And now I get told, shit, you look like you're in your early 30s now. It's, it's amazing yeah, just, just it's from amazing, stopping drinking. I mean, it's a massive amount that you were drinking. That was a huge amount that you're consuming. Like if you think it's about 32 bottles of wine a week. So how did you feel physically coming off that? And and what what did you do? Like, how did you stop? Did you just go, that's that's it i like i said i wasn't at, I, I wasn't at the point where um i was physically reliant on alcohol like as i said you know some alcoholics they can't stop they have to you know do all sorts of yeah. medication and stuff like that but i i just stopped and i did a detox so I, I um there was this green intestinal drink that i drank then it just cleaned out my innards um and that that was a big help but drank a lot of water I, and my body thanked me for stopping um, just the amount of water I drank. And the first six months, there were big changes, but it wasn't until after month six that I really saw everything kick into overdrive. Um, and I use, I like to quote you, this, and I actually heard it in the Scotty Owen episode this morning, your productivity levels go into overdrive when you stop. Um, I mean, I was, I was so productive. And I still am productive. Um, but back in January, I was actually, I spent six hours working on a, um, an automation that would automatically save my training plan templates into a folder and rename it. it took six hours. Now that happens at the press of a button. I would never have done that before when I was drinking. Just little tasks like that to make my daily life easier. Um, I mean, uh, Ash went into it in another, I don't know, it was, uh, it was Scotty mentioned that how he gets up uh, early, he can do stuff in the morning now. He goes to bed, he can do stuff in the evening. And it's the same for me. I'm up at 5 a.m. every day, clockwork. Um, body gets me up. I'm not, it's not an, an, a, not an alarm. Um, the best way I describe this to people who ask me what's it like is, you know, when you, when you were drinking, there's probably four stages of drinking. When you get a little bit tipsy or you're a little bit drunk, you have that buzz. It's when you start chatting and you feel really good. You know, you've got an energy increase. That's the good part of drinking. Then you get tipsy and you're still having fun. Then you're drunk. Then you just then it's blackout. So there's the, the stages there. I'm at that buzz, that first stage when I wake up every single morning. I'm just got this natural buzz out of bed to the gym, 5 a.m. There for two, two and a half hours, and back into my day. It's 7.30, 8, 8 o'clock, and I start my day. It's great. Yes, I love that. I feel the same. I wake up like like... Ash doesn't. <laughs> I really annoy him actually in the morning because I wake up and I've got so much energy. I'm like, whoa, let's go. You know, it's it's crazy how much energy. Yeah. But not everyone. Yeah. Some people hear that and go, hang on, where's my fucking energy? But no, but I wasn't. I was never. I was never a morning person, especially when I was doing the the whole DJ electronic music industry. It was like, you know, it was mm. reversed. So tell me, what was the main takeaway from Alan Carr's book? Main takeaway there. Uh, two things one get in touch with the younger self now I'll, I'll touch a bit more on that because um, one of the things I started doing when I was walking I discovered Spotify 
I was making playlists, making playlists of all the music I listened to as a teenager, as a kid, before I was drinking. And when I'm walking 20 kilometers, just listening to that, and it just brings me back to my, my childhood. Um, and it makes it so much easier. And, and now when I'm in the gym, again, listening to podcasts, listening to songs and stuff I listened to as a kid. Um, so that was one big takeaway, getting in touch with the younger self. Uh, the other one is dispelling the reasons to drink goes through, uh, you know, getting courage, you know, being able to talk to a girl or something like that, or, you know, oh, I, it, it's nice after a, a meal. It's nice to drink when smoking. Um, it makes me more chatty. Well, actually, no, it makes you more, it makes you more uh, socially recluse. The big one for me is, and this, and I don't want to be all preachy and, you know, someone who's, I always say to people, you keep drinking. It's my choice not to, um, but I'm not going to preach to you and say how awesome things are. You do you. But to me, if you're going to drink, it's just like drinking poison now to me. I have no interest in drinking alcohol anymore. It's poison. I may as well go buy a thing of hand sanitizer and add some raspberry flavor to it. And there you go. You, you get the same effect. You still get drunk. Um, so that's, that's how I view alcohol now. It sounds all preachy, but that's just how it is. One of the things that I was worried about when I stopped, would I cop backlash from, you know, the team and stuff like that? Because it's very polarizing, especially in rugby circles, because it's a big thing drinking, you know, the third half drinking after the game. It's a big thing. Um, and I, I have no issue with the teams I coach, you know, having a beer and stuff after. What I did notice when I did try and stop a lot of times, people would say to you, like you'd say, look, I'm trying to stop drinking. Oh, we'll fix that. Oh, well, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll change that. Don't worry. And I put my foot down. One of my good friends here um, and one of the guys I report to, and, and he, he's brilliant. He said that to me when I first said, look, I'm stopping. And he goes, oh, we'll see about that. And I said, no, really. And I said, I got pretty stroppy with him. I said, this is the fucking problem. When someone says they have a problem, they want to stop, you go and say that. And he, he backed up straight away and said, okay, no, I see you're serious. Now he sees the difference. He's seen the improvement and everything. And um, But that, that, that's, there's kind of that sort of stigma when, Someone's trying to stop. Others will, will try and keep you on the train. I don't know if you've had much experience with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot at the start. It's just that yeah. resistance to get from friends that don't want to lose their drinking buddy, I guess. And, or they don't want to have to look at their, their own cells and their own drinking patterns maybe. But I love that you were really serious about it and that you, the fact that you just said, no, this is what I need to do. And really backed yourself i think that's really cool too and it's gutsy to do that well i did that in the past like in the like i tried in the past and i'd say i'm stopping and then of course i'd get there oh, we'll see about that and to be fair it actually happened when i went back to chicago the second time i said no i'm stopping and they, and they just gave me this look like we'll see how long that lasts and sure that wasn't them it was me within an hour i said oh fuck it give me a beer and so um but this time i was pretty steadfast i was stopping yeah so, Carl, what did you do? Um, how did you combat the cravings and the triggers, the loneliness? You know, what did you do when you were triggered? Um, okay, so this time when I stopped, I didn't have any triggers at all, not with the alcohol, because this decision had been happening over the two or three years prior. Mm. Um, now, with the loneliness, um, I'm, I'm, a pretty, I'm a pretty introverted person. Um, I mean, as a rugby coach, um, and this is something Scotty touched on as well in his, his interview, it's a lone, he, he said it's very lonely being a muso. Um, and, you know, you're waiting around for sound checks, you're waiting around for things to start. So you naturally drink. I went from a profession where I was making music, um, I was doing gigs, and I was, you know, I was, I was the center of attention. I was, I was Carl making the music. Oh, you make wicked tunes. I was, I was loved. Then when you turn to a rugby coach, it's your job to make people do things they don't want to do. So all of a sudden, I'm now, I'm bad. I'm the bad person. I'm, I'm Carl the asshole. And that took me a, a long time to, um, to sort of overcome. Mm. And I'm, I'm fully acceptable of that now. I've got no issues with that. But that now leads me to be even more reclusive. So dealing with loneliness is, is quite easy for me because I've, you know, I've, I've, I talk to my sister a lot. Um, I listen to a lot of audio books and podcasts. Um, and I'm also... I'm also into video editing, so I take a lot of videos and stuff like that. So I'm okay by myself. I'm not really a, 
I had maybe maybe three or four times over the first two months for about honestly about 10 seconds I had oh, I'd, I'd buy a bottle of wine now ah, fuck it I don't want to do that um, so in all honesty the triggers all came in the two three years prior when I was in Chicago um, they and when I had my little inner spidey voice talking to me they, they all came then when I'd made the decision to stop that was it I'd stop the, the cravings I say with air quotes would last about 10 seconds and then it'd go away the mere fact that you wake up without a hangover and not feeling like a bag of dicks was enough for me to not drink and just the fact that i get that energy buzz in the morning now is even more reason and the, and the results i've seen just from within spiritually physically mentally from january to now has just made things awesome and that's the alan carr thing that i got from the smoking book which i used a lot i, I never read the drinking one but his book um the only way to quit smoking i think that's what it's called the takeaway i got from that and i use that to quit alcohol basically the same kind of thing was focusing the focus was more on what i was gaining than what i was missing out i talk about this a lot on the podcast but Spot exactly on. what you were doing too so you focus more on what's good and what's working less than what you're missing out on or spot on and i'm i'm glad you brought that up because I, I should have mentioned that um it's one of the biggest challenges people have when they stop drinking is they think that the fear of missing out the fomo um and it's if you like if you have that feeling of deprivation um where you're constantly you think you're missing out on something then it's a challenge to stop if you have an abundance mindset where you're embracing no, this is actually really good. Geez, I'm waking up not hungover. Then that's when you have that, when you switch to that mindset, it makes it so much easier. Yes. And mine was waking up, like just getting my thrills off waking up and actually yeah, not feeling guilty, not feeling anxious, not hating myself, and not yep. waking up thinking of what I do last night. So for yeah, me, that was exactly. enough for me to focus on to keep me going. So, and I'd say to anyone, keep your focus on, on what's good and what's working and don't look back because you don't need to look in the rear vision mirror. You need to look forward, keep going forward. And Ash, one thing Ash always says is like you choose your own level of suffering, no matter what it is in life, but you choose your own level of suffering as well when you're quitting alcohol. So you choose if it's going to be a shit show and really hard or you can choose to make it really optimistic and looking forward and enjoy the process. Well, yeah, I mean, one of the, the hard things I was I was worried about when I stopped was um, the whole social thing after a game because when you, mm. when you finish a game with your seniors, there's usually a boat race, you know, you're having beers and, you, you know, it's a really nice social setting. Um, before I stopped drinking, though, I'd already made the decision um, probably 2018 to not drink with the team. I'd have a couple of beers with them, but the moment things start get, getting messy, you've got to get out of there as a coach because then that's when you start getting the, the guy coming, whoa, why'd you put this guy on the pitch? Or, you know, well, would, uh, I, think you, I think your training sucks, stuff like that. So I made that decision before I even stopped drinking. So it's even easier now. Um, but one of the things I was worried about was going to social functions with the club. Um, thankfully, that hasn't been bad. Like I, I think the first one was just after restrictions ease here in Sweden with the pandemic. Um, we had a function at the local sports bar here, and I just went there and I was drinking Red Bulls, and everyone was fine with it. Um, and then we had another another function. Uh, I think we had our first game a couple of weeks ago, and again, people were getting on the piss afterwards, and. and you know they know that i'm not drinking now so it's like i, I smoke bomb out of there um, my my mindset is now okay i'll do the formalities with some of the fans yep cool game yep great players well done right i'm out of there i'm already cutting the video um i'm, I'm already analyzing the game ready for the players the next day on sunday so when they wake up hungover everything's there for them to see so that's kind of the mindset i have now when it comes to after match functions yeah it's great that's so cool it's, it sounds like you've just got your head in the right space. And I think quitting alcohol is all about the headspace that you get yourself into and the mindset that you choose to go with. So it sounds like you're, you've are you nailed it. My last guest that I had, um, Chris, so many of us, we're in and out, we're in and out. So we're like, we quit for a few months and then we go back and we quit for a few months and go back. And often we find that the drinking stays the same, if not gets worse. But I think each time you stop, you learn a bit more, you learn a bit more about yourself, you learn a bit more about your triggers, you 
get more and more prepared for when the time you actually do come to stop. So whilst I don't recommend people to go and, and relapse if they've had time off, but don't be too hard on yourself as well. If you have gone back and you know, you're back in that cycle again, just know that each time I, I think you get closer and closer to being free from it. If you're learning stuff from each, each time you go back, would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you, you pretty much summed up the last two, three years where I was stopping, starting, stopping, starting. Um, and it, the biggest lesson I got out of that was I can't be a two wine, enjoy a two wine over dinner person. I, I had to, it was either all or nothing. That was the big, and big takeaway. One, this is, <laughs> I hear this all the time with people. I think I can go back to just a couple of drinks and I always think, Pretty much now, actually, say no, don't don't kid yourself. But if that's no. what you want to do, go ahead and try it because everyone has to learn that for themselves. Yeah, exactly. And um, um, you know, I've got a couple of friends um that have that actually stopped for a, a month or two with me, and they're they're back to drinking, albeit some of them are drinking less. But at the same time, it's like, no, I'm not going to preach to you here. You you work you out, and then when you when you realise it just doesn't work like that, then I'll welcome yeah, you back. Yeah, but there's something in. <laughs> In getting to that point where you realize actually no i'm not that person i'm actually i can't moderate i've tried it i've tried it so many yeah. times um you know and there's something in that where you just have that acceptance of okay this is not work okay i have to get rid of this and it's actually whilst it could be sad at first or if you, like that grieving thing you're talking about too like you because you kind of can be like that but you just it's just not possible for some, you know, for some people. And I think just having that acceptance and being okay with it is really freeing. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. The moment you, I mean, as the common theme, you know this, when someone wants to stop something, it, it has to come within. It cannot be told by someone else. Um, and which is why I, I really wanted to emphasize that no one told me that Carl, you're drinking too much. You've got to stop, especially my girlfriend. My girlfriend was here every time. You know, she was here for three months for the first part of that pandemic. She would see it. She didn't bat an eyelid, you know. But if, if she was probably in my ear going, you need to stop, I would probably say, fuck you. I'm going to keep going. But it was, you know, my own voice inside my head, my own uh, self-reflection that I, I saw the need to stop. Um, and it's only ever going to come from within. So looking back, what advice would you give your young self? I knew you were going to ask me that. And um, the, the simple answer to that is, Carl, it's going to be tough, but don't change a thing. Because honestly, <laughs> I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now if I hadn't had all these tough experiences over the last 42 years of my life. Um, so I mean, there was, there's been probably, there's probably been maybe two or three um, sliding doors moments in my life where, geez, I wonder what would have happened if I'd have done that there. But at the, at the end of the day, I'd just say to myself, Carl, it's going to be tough, but you'll, you'll be all right. Um, and I'm just happy. I mean, I, I mentioned to you off before we started that my mum died three weeks ago, 7th of August, and I'm just happy she saw me healthy. She at least had peace in that, knowing that I'll, I'll be all right. And that's what I'd tell myself is, Carl, it's going to be tough, but you're going to be all right. Yeah, absolutely. I love that too. Um, Carl, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. And I will put your contact details in the show notes if anyone wants to reach out to you. Yeah, for sure. Talk rugby. I've never had a rugby coach in here before, so that's pretty exciting. Thanks, Carl. Thank you Speak very much. Speak soon.